Hi everyone, welcome back to Somerset House and our digital series, Upgrade Yourself Peer Exchange. I'm Scott, one of the creative producers at Somerset House, where I lead on the Creative Careers and Skills Programme. Today's event is being streamed live on Twitch, Somerset House website, YouTube Live, Facebook Live and Twitter. If you'd like to ask any questions and for a chance that may get read out during the next hour, please comment on one of our platforms using hashtag Somerset House. Our Creative Careers Programme supports emerging new talent and offers access routes into the creative industries, which we deliver as three strands. The first strand is the Creative Careers Academy, which offers full-time work placements, fairly paid at London Living Wage, within the creative sector and on-site at Somerset House. The second strand is the Creative Job Studio, mentoring and networking events in partnership with Charity Creative Society. And the third strand is Upgrade Yourself, skills enhancing workshops and talks both delivered digitally and IRL. Today, we have artist Eloise Hauser, who will be sharing her experiences, some practical tips and advice from her practice. And for now, sit back, relax, grab a pen and paper, get comfortable, as I'm delighted to introduce you to Eloise. Eloise, hello. Hello. <laughs> thank how you are so you? Much. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very good. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so we have a brilliant presentation from you that, we will, um, that you'll walk us through, and then I'll catch up. I'll be jumping in and out. Um, with some questions from the audience. So if you're happy to take it away, then you can share your screen. Great. Okay. Uh, I think you have to make me host. Oh, sorry about that. That's my fault. Oops, bear with me one second. Uh, yes, sorry, Eloise, that's... No problem. Uh, yeah, that's you, you should be host. Mm. Not yet, <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, now, now I can, great. That's you, take it away, thank you, Eloise, take it away. <laughs> so, oh, we're starting at the end, finishing, so we're going to see the whole thing first, great. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Thank Can you see that? Uh, okay. Uh, hi. Uh, so I'm Eloise uh, Horser. Uh, as Scott said, I'm a sculptor uh, uh, living and uh, practicing in London. I've been in practice for uh, over 10 years, actually. Uh, I prepared this talk for younger artists um, and also art students. Uh, to tell you a bit about myself and my work um, and then I'm going to offer some pointers uh, and uh, that have been valuable to my practice, uh, things I would have liked to have known at the start of my career. I've lived in London all my life. Uh, the longest I've spent away from London was for art school. I went to the Ruskin uh, from 2004 uh, till 2007 and then I went to Frankfurt's Stadel School in Germany between um, 2009 and 2012. Um, at art school I was making sort of straight up sculptures and assemblages from wood, clay, um, polystyrene, pretty much anything, uh, bookcases, uh, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. Um, I was a real sort of fan of uh, just piling things up um, and this is this is one of my pieces, very first pieces. It's on a it's on a sort of push push uh, tray. Um, I wasn't actually a very talented carpenter or welder or, or great maker of things. Uh, particularly, I had a problem with armatures. So uh, the assemblages and works I made often kind of fell fell apart, and I couldn't really get them up. I couldn't easily attach things. Um, and uh, in short, I got quite overwhelmed by the by sort of materials and the, the task of making things that would stand up and eventually could be shown in public. Um, I, I bring this, I raise this because in hindsight, I think my practice uh, started to develop from this frustration, this frustration um, in my kind of natural lack of making abilities. So um, during my master's in Frankfurt's Städel School, um, I started to look at how things are put together more seamlessly um, uh, in industrial or in manufacturing applications um, on a large scale. Um, I was particularly interested at that time in really commonplace items that I was encountering every day. 
Um, and a lot of the objects that I worked with were things like mascots um, and decorations uh, or even furniture uh, from an office that I was working on, uh, working in part time. Um, so these, uh, this was a, a decoration that was in the office. Um, this was the first work I, oh, go back. This was the first work I made in Frankfurt. And it's, um, it was also a, a small paper lantern um, that was carried by German children um, during the festival of Saint Martin, which happens every November. And uh, together with a student of architecture who was also studying at the Stadel School, we, um, we looked at the structure of the folded paper and we, um, we drew it um, on Rhino and we, uh, we created it and we tooled it, enlarged it and tooled it into this large uh, polyurethane lantern uh, disc. Um, so, um, so along with uh, reproducing objects, I, I became really interested in, in surfaces and um, just in, in what could be achieved through simple changes in, in the surface of an object. This is a scanner that I found was being thrown out of the office where I was working and they gave me it kindly and I had it flocked, which is a process where you apply a, a very fine fur to it. So it was, it was a, an X scanner and it was covered in a blue fur. Um, and uh, these, this work was um, a work of mine where I took uh, the the uh, the uh, what a part of a photocopier. I was doing a lot of photocopying, and I uh, I tooled it uh, into a into a, a model of of a human head. So this is the this is the paper sorting uh, part of a photocopier, um, kind of fused with a human head. Um, I was also really interested in the composition of materials. Um, so one of the early pieces I did at art school was to try and, uh, oh, we jump through there, but it was to try and um, recreate my own chipboard. Again, I refer to chipboard and I, I, it was part of my probably interest in very commonplace uh, material. Chipboard was very ubiquitous. It was easy, very affordable. Um, and uh, I was running through a lot of a lot of it and a lot of different woods. And this was a this was a piece of mine where I um, actually just cast all of the bits of woods wood that was in the studio um, to make this kind of uh, composite chipboard uh, chipboard piece of office desk. It was an office desk. Um, so I've gone on to pursue this uh, this interest in the particularity of uh, materials um, and um, and construction, um, uh, especially with a sort of an interest in the everyday. This is uh, this is a, a piece of mine that uh, was made of um, a, a shelving system, um, and it's I've refolded um, a set of uh, shelves from a filing cabinet to make this pedestal here. Um, I uh, I've also so worked quite a lot with glass. Um, people think about glass as a very uh, fragile artisanal material, but in fact, it's it's really very um, robust. It can be used in a whole variety of applications, um, uh, which is to sort of make a note that it was really at this point um, when I was a student in Frankfurt that I shifted away from this idea of sculpture as a, as a form of assembling of raw materials like wood and clay. And I began to think about how objects are in a different way sculpted through the manufacturing and making process. Um, after finishing my masters, I moved back to London and I started to visit um, uh, manufacturing and industrial sites. Uh, these are often small industrial estates on the outskirts of London. Um, so this was uh, a, this is a company called Velopax, and it's in Halston, and they um, they make uh, X-ray equipment for dentists, uh, and they also sell um, the uh, the solution. Um, so these are this when you uh, put Velopax into Google, you can see the range of um, of products they make, and um, you can also see one of my works as well. Um, I I I found uh, Velopax uh, when I was uh exploring 
a part of Halston where they actually also have a lot of very small uh, stone masons and uh, metal shops. A lot of those uh, serve the uh, prop making industry, which is, uh, for some reason, it's just where they all uh, where they make a lot of special effects and props um, and then these kind of sites or, or seeing these kind of sites and these smaller factories I started to think about the objects that I'd seen around them and uh, about borrowing objects and, and working with them i.e. sort of taking things directly from the active processes going on in manufacturing or industrial spaces um, this is a picture of a work of mine called 100 Kev. Um, it's an x-ray of a truck which I managed to borrow, I was given, um, and, uh, and you can see the Velopex jerry cans um, in, the, in the front here. Um, I'll come back to, um, to 100 Kev um, a little bit later, but for the moment I just want to emphasise with found or specialised images like this x-ray, how you collapse the idea of production into the idea of display. So an object or an image becomes this signpost for other contexts or places beyond that of the gallery that it occupies. Um, this kind of thinking also led me to explore site specificity in more detail. And um, that was something that I began to think that film would capture really well. Um, my first film I shot um, after art school was called Sunrise Plaza. Um, and I'll come back again to that later, um, but uh, it allowed me, here's a picture of it, um, and it was, a, it was a film that just focused on this one building, um, and using film allowed me to record a site as a whole, uh, focusing on its architecture, its, the processes, the, the spaces around it, um, its aesthetic, uh, something that you couldn't really get across through a single physical object. Um, and from this point on, I started to pair film with found objects. Um, I explored this in my first solo show in London, in the, which was at the ICA, and it uh, had as its subject the cinema organ, uh, which was a type of, it, of organ that was used in, uh, in old cinemas uh, in the silent film era. And uh, in the film, there was uh, in the show, there was a film of a uh, cinema organ, which is actually um, permanently interred um, in Regent Street in the headquarters of the Burberry store. So I filmed in that in the store um, after hours and we filmed the organ and it was displayed in the show. And also I displayed um, in the exhibition some uh, parts I'm not sure if you can see some uh, some inner um, workings from an actual organ. So this was a part of the actual organ, and this was the video. Um, I've since gone on since this solo show at uh, the ICA. I've gone on to uh, exhibit uh, another solo show here at Somerset House in 2018. Again, which I will talk about a little bit later on, and then. Most recently, um, I participated in the Istanbul Biennale uh, over the summer um, in Istanbul with a series of films which are shot uh, in waste management sites. So, uh, so that's a quick overview of my work. Um, and then I wanted to go on to um, to share with you some skills um, and uh, this is the Skillshare um, and uh, so hopefully just to tell you a bit about how I've worked with so many different objects and sites and, and I'm going to share with you some stories um, so um, and also some sort of key terms for me um, and for my practice. Um, so uh, so the, first, uh, the first term that I wanted to talk about is a uh, curiosity, which um, uh, it, it, it sounds really, really cliched, but I'm going for it. Uh, there are obviously curiosity hugely important. There are potential subjects everywhere. So uh, be alert to them. Um, I, I've aimed, you can never be too curious. And my aim is for uh, a practice that's 
really rooted in curiosity and I've, I've really tried to hone that um, and uh, just treat it as a skill um, and just to read up on things, to research things, to go beyond appearances and immediate impressions and really try to work out what it is that I'm curious about, why I'm curious about something. Um, and, uh, and then the second part of curiosity, which I think is really important, is the active part of curiosity, the part of curiosity which leads to um, an exchange. So part of the idea of curiosity for me requires approaching people that work outside you know, people outside of your friends outside of family relatives people in the art world it's about making connections with people that you don't know that work in really different fields and areas um i've always thought perhaps one of the boons of being an artist who isn't making things by myself and my studio or perhaps wasn't that competent with making things is that i was really dependent on and on having an exchange with others um to explore things um, that I'm curious about. I need to communicate with others. I need to ask them, how, how do they make this or that? How does it work? What does it do? What tools and processes were involved in making this thing? Um, and sometimes I think for a really good piece of work, you need to bring as many or a lot of exchanges together and, and really to try and think about them in relation to one another. And um, so I wanted to also tell you um, to illustrate this idea, I want to tell you a bit about my show, which uh, I did here in 2018 at Somerset House. Uh, the show is about the River Thames, particularly um, about the engineering that's been carried out to reshape and control it, um, which is very relevant to Somerset House. Uh, I wanted to, because Somerset House obviously sits on the river, um, I wanted to collect lots of images and diagrams from over the ages, just showing how we've developed our ability to manipulate the flow of water um, in the case of Somerset House away from the building um, through the initial building of the embankment. Um, in the process of creating this show, I met with really a lot of different people, um, just a few of them, uh, uh, sci there was sci scientists, researchers, uh, we spoke to people uh, running river tours for tourists, we spoke to a civil engineer, there was uh, Jonathan the curator working on the show, uh, there were other artists at Somerset House involved. Um, this picture here is us uh, working with two guys who uh, drive a tug along the Thames. And this is a friend of mine, Laura, who we are taking some sound recordings. Um, all of these people came together, uh, came to this subject with their own positions and with their own ways of relating to it and um, understanding it. And it really broadened my thinking about the exhibition. Um, so um, I'm gonna take you a quick overview. Um, so here are some uh, drawings that were somewhat of a starting point uh, for the show. Um, I had, uh, these are these uh, um, some technical drawings of actually, they were um, uh, uh, um, about a hundred years ago, they were the first uh, technical drawings for the sewer, which they were implanting um, in the embankment. Um, and uh, the Thames Tideway project uh, will be the first time that they've basically um, done any work on, on the uh, London sewers since uh, they were laid down over a hundred years ago by Joseph Bazalgette. So, um, so these drawings were the starting point for today for, for today's engineers. So um, just as I did, they went to the Institute of civil engineers library and they looked at these old technical drawings and using these old technical drawings they planned uh, exactly how they were going to intercept uh, the Victorian sewer and where they were going to intercept it they they drew their drawings on the back of this old technical drawing and this actually was one of the first sketches for the sewer so again you have this idea of an exchange here it's an exchange over hundreds of years and through the language of technical drawing um, between two engineers um, so these are section drawings showing the new sewer which will be um, just down from the new intersecting sewer um, which will be just down down from Somerset House um, 
and uh, these were in my exhibition they were shared shared in my exhibition and I also um this is a this is a drawer this is a um rendering of the intercepting sewer so you can see what they're doing is they're taking a slice out of the embankment they're chopping through the old sewer and they're putting this large larger deeper pipe that will uh where the, the water that will um bring the water down when it when it reaches capacity um and uh i use this i use this um hang on oops I use this model, this render, as uh, in the exhibition. Um, I recreated it here. Um, there was a model, and here is the new intercepting sewer. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, this this was also in the exhibition. Um, on the left hand side um, is. Uh, a still image from a film that was in the exhibition. It, it's not actually a film, it's a simulation. Uh, and the simulation is um, a ship simulation, which is used to teach um, uh, the shipmen and uh, people driving uh, boats uh, how to uh, navigate along the Thames. So like we have a flight simulator, this is a ship simulator. Um, and uh, this file is, owned and maintained by a company in Oxfordshire called HR Wallingford and it's uh, it's routinely updated because obviously whenever they build a new building along the Thames they have to call in uh, some technical draftsmen and some 3D renderers to update the file so it has this kind of life running parallel in a way to, to the river itself is this um, virtual simulation of the river um which is used as a training file on uh this this piece here on the right hand side is um a uh, is a ring is a is a similar a ring vortex um it was uh, it's a project that was a phd um thesis project from um a italian um um scientist who um is exploring the phenomenon of uh, ring vortexes in flow so i wanted to have something that was actually live water in the show so that was in the exhibition um these are a really fascinating um category of objects uh they're called medical imaging phantoms and uh these are uh, objects which are manufactured um, to be placed into um, CT and X-rays um, in lieu of the human body. So when they need to test um, CT and X-ray machines, of course, they can't test those machines on live limbs. So they have a, a series of uh, objects which they use to, to check that these are uh, the machines are working um, and these are in the exhibition as well so as you can see a whole constellation of different of different objects files diagrams um, this, this here was a um, a 3d render of uh, our vasculature that's another view of the of the um, of the show uh, there's a close-up of that. That was a um, uh, an animation of uh, flow through our veins and arteries. Um, so that was an overview of um, the show at Somerset House. Um, I wanted to now come back because we're in the Skillshare part. Um, how are we doing, Scott? For time, are we all right? We're great for time, um, Eloise. I'm absolutely great. So just okay. <clears throat> so just go, <laughs> sorry. So just um just to go back um uh, because uh we're talking about curiosity um and how curiosity can lead to an exchange and that exchange can maybe lead to uh an exhibition and to a wonderful thing like this set of um animations. Um I've got another example for you. Um so I was uh um, we, ha we have to go back in time in my own um, trajectory. Um, I, I used to drive a lot of my artwork around and I was once transporting it 
in a van um we were driving uh over the border and our van got scanned and i thought this was a very uh fascinating and very eerie process and i i I really wanted to understand better what types of technology um, are used for scanning vehicles, um, which naturally takes me back to the X-ray of the lorry, which I perhaps showed you at the beginning, um, which was shown eventually at the Tate. Um, anyway, uh, obviously we associate X-rays with medical contexts um, and illness. Uh, it was quite strange to find myself in this almost banal situation being having our, our vehicle scanned um, and I wrote after this experience I wrote to to the port uh, I wrote to various ports actually um, uh, to ask whether they would share with me uh, some of their uh, scans of, of vehicles uh, I wanted to find out you know how, where their scans are kept because they must be huge the resolution required to scan something 17 meters long um, and uh, and who reviews the scans and how quickly they what they're looking for and how quickly they they under, uh, can read them. Um, I just there were so many questions I had, um, and I wrote those questions to to a number of different ports and to Border Force. Um, I didn't get any replies, of course. Um, so I did some research on this, and I found out that there was a trade show um, coming up um, at uh, Kensington Olympia, and it was called the Counter Terrorism Trade Show. Um, so I I um, I wrote to them and I uh, requested a pass, which I was granted. And when I went there, um, I met a lot of companies that specialize in scanning, and a couple of that actually are uh, specialize in the scanning of vehicles. Um, and actually, I wanted to say something very important for me. I never um, lied to the companies in any way. I said I was an artist and I was hoping to um, understand more about scanning and ultimately to use some of the scans in an artwork. Um, and I did meet some no's, but I was also given a business card for a UK company called Smith's Detections, who I then called and eventually met up with. And Smith's Detections, uh, shared with me uh, the file, the x-ray of the scan, which is a real file that they have done. Um, and um, they allowed me to exhibit it. Here is an image of it um, that I produced this PDF to send to Smith's Detections to explain, um, to explain myself and why I wanted the scan. Uh, my point here is really how you can follow up on these exchanges that you have and how you can, if you do research, call people. And also importantly, don't lie about what you want and your, your intentions. Actually, in a in a interesting way, most people respond very positively when you say that you're an artist, which is encouraging. Um, one of the strengths I think is that people don't take art that seriously. They think that uh, you're not, uh, you, they don't see you as a danger, um, unlike say a journalist, which we can return to, that's for a whole nother situation, a uh, whole nother conversation. But, but as an artist, there's generally a view, a very positive view. So you do end up getting, I've, you know, people take, take you very well, which is great. Um, if you get no's, you know, um, there's always exchanges to be had. There's always an exchange to be had with someone else um, that might get you closer to what it is you want. Or perhaps you'll find out there was something else that you were interested in along the way. Um, so then I'm going to move, moving away. That kind of concludes curiosity. That's the truck uh, piece, um, which was uh, shown at, at the Tate. Um, Moving away from the idea of curiosity, um, I want to talk a bit more about uh, the importance of sight. And um, I think it's really important um, to think about sight and what a sight is and what a sight entails. Um, so this is from Sunrise Plaza, again, this building which I shot, um, just to come back to that. Um, so in actual fact, um, I encountered Sunrise Plaza when I was working with an, uh, uh, another firm around the corner from Sunrise Plaza, which was called Shard de Glass, and they made um, structural and architectural glass. They were working on a, a large project um, 
for the new terminal at Heathrow Airport. That was Terminal Five, um, and so they were and they uh, they were on the Uxbridge Road, and this building was on the Uxbridge Road as well. They were just off the Uxbridge Road, so very close to Heathrow Airport. Um, on the drive to Sherwood Glass, uh, the landmark building to turn off was was this building, Sunrise Plaza, which obviously was it was in a very derelict state, um, and um, it had it had lain empty for um, fifteen years, um, and uh, and because it was almost entirely empty. Um, when I, I used to go very, very early in the morning to Shard of Glass, um, t it, the factory ran 24 hours a day and I used to go often at sort of five in the morning. And I, I once saw the sun rising through Sunrise Plaza and it looked extraordinary like it was burning. So I, uh, I set about trying to, to film that and just to capture uh, this, this effect of the sun illuminating Sunrise Plaza. Um, I guess what my point here is that what made Sunrise Plaza so interesting is that it's only, it had only really been allowed to reach that state of dereliction because it's on the edge of London, um, not the centre. And it was also in a very low rise part of the city because of its, uh, because it was in the flight path. Um, so it, it had this view. Um, and it had there was a very kind of ephemeral air around the the location, uh, and it was actually uh, due to be demolished. And a number of films that I took of the building, you can actually see the people inside who were demolishing it. Um, so, um, so I, I guess the point being here that a site is not necessarily about an enormous industrial space. Um, I shot this film from a car park adjacent. Um, and, uh, and again, um, it's not necessarily about um, one site. It's also about the relationship of, uh, of, a, of a building to, to space and to the city. Um, it, was a, it was free to, to access. It was a relatively local. Um, yeah, and so that's um, that's Sunrise Plaza. Uh, now my final um, sort of part of the Skillshare, my final term, if you like. So we've covered curiosity, uh, thinking about a site. Um, my my final term I wanted to to use with, is a uh, is proper engagement. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about public engagement and how public engagement really is its own kind of practice. Um, you, you'll find when you apply for grants, and I have been the recipient of some grants, um, you, you need to demonstrate uh, pub how public engagement is an aspect of your work. For me, uh, public engagement is not an incidental part of my work. It's some something I'm uh, really interested in in pursuing at the beginning of a project at, the, at a project's outset um, in order to have as many exchanges new perspectives and ideas um, which can of course actually feed into the end work or they can stand alone as their own kind of practice um, this picture here is uh, is a site um, in Brentford um, in Transport Avenue and it's a recycling site that I've worked with for five five years uh, they ha they have uh, no more than five years many years they have um they have locations all around England and they recycle ferrous and non-ferrous metals um, including many things that we use daily these are uh, printing plates which are used to print the newspapers um, and uh, during all of the times that I've worked with them um they've been extremely generous to me and i've worked um with many of the things that they process as sculptural items but i've also um we've done several tours um this is a group of uh young people we took to their site uh with sunset houses learning team so we're here on site uh looking at the different types of metals that they process and then again really recently we went uh, to Tilbury, um, with uh, to Tilbury Port, um, 
I um, t it's the same the same company um, have a processing site for metals in Tilbury Port, and uh, here we went up the crane. This was a, with a group here. Um, just before lockdown, I organised a series of tours to which, of which this was one um, to waste management facilities in Essex um, with a wonderful gallery focal point in South End, um, which was sponsored by the Arts Council. Um, we visited uh, landfill sites, recycling centres, rewilded wetlands and a power plant. Um, uh, at the time, I wasn't organising the tours with a particular piece of work in mind, but um, but but thought of this as the practice of engaging with people in and sites. Um, uh, so uh, that being the members of public that came on the tours, uh, the the people that showed us around sites. Um, but actually, a piece of work did develop out of this experience, which I went on to exhibit uh, in the Istanbul Biennale. Uh, so I do a lot of uh, tours and walks um, outside London and inside London as a way of keeping my practice collective um, and as a way of not thinking about my art as purely an individual pursuit. Um, and because engaging with people is a practice in and of itself and one that can be absolutely key and formative, um, with, which also chimes with what I was saying earlier about creating links and exchanges with people and bringing out all the different ways which people invest emotionally, intellectually and practically in sites and materials. Learning how to respond to these collective exchanges and investments for me is really what art is about. And that is the end of wow. my skill share bit. <laughs> is that... Hello. I, Yes, Eleanor, Eloise, I'm going to jump back in again. Is that okay? Yes. I'll come back on screen. How are you? I'm Thank you so much. All right. How are you? <laughs> yep. Very good. If you stop sharing your screen, um, yeah. the audience will be able to see us both having a sort of chat. Um, brilliant. Eloise, that was so fantastic. I wanted to jump in at one point, but I just thought you were oh, no. had such good, you had such great flow. I just thought, I just wanted to hear it. I'm absolutely fascinated. Um, thanks so much for sharing. I loved, as you were talking, I was taking lots of notes and you kind of answered each of my questions during the whole um, presentation. I loved the x-ray, how you sort of used your research skills and your investigation skills to figure out how you could approach that company by going to Smith's, detec uh, Smith's Detections. Um, uh, it, was, it was really brilliant. <laughs> You must have a question though. I do have films if you wanted to see them, but I obviously didn't bring them out. Um, That's okay. Well, so because we've, we've got 20 minutes left of the session, so we've got lots of questions coming in, um, okay. but any any films or any links, we can put them on the, the post event page and link back to your website and stuff so the audience can still get to see more of your work. If you're happy mm -hmm. with that. So we've got lots of questions coming in, um, if you're happy. Yeah. To start, I'll just start firing, firing over at you. Um, when you were talking about the blue flop scanner, yeah. um, and that's really striking, one question about colour has come in. Um, how mixed materials and found objects, how important is colour to you? And do you often um, reappropriate objects or paint them? That's the question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh color again you know um uh it it really depends on um on what uh you know it's dependent on the in the case of the blue scanner i was trying to get across a feeling um and it was a, a kind of um there was a very particular palette so that body of work I was working in an office and I uh, I used some fabric which was used for office cubicles and I used um, this this light blue um, there was a sort of and it may have just been that office that there was a sort of light kind of pastel mutedness to a lot of the furniture around there um, and that was the the choice of color for me so I think mm. you know it, it, it in many ways, if I can um, stay true to to an object, to an experience, to the colour that's sort of inherent in the in the found 
object or you know in in the sort of ambience that I'm looking for I will do so I don't kind of apply color over the top of something as a sort of painter does you know in and of yeah. itself to to mm -hmm. evoke mood or something mm, that's really interesting when, when you spoke about working in the office was that sort of part-time job just a sort of job you were doing to like support your art practice that's right. Yeah. So it was a German office and it was um, when I was a student and um, mm. and it was, yeah, it was part time. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was working in uh, the student services. So I was doing a lot of admin. Um, yeah. And I think when you do those kind of roles, you, you want to skip that work and get back onto your practice. I think people watching this, they might have different part time jobs to support their income, will, might feel like that as well, I guess. Well, I, 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 of course, wanted to be in the studio as much as possible, but I also, um, it was a very absorbing place and it, there were a number of really interesting things there. Like, well, one mm. thing, as I said, was that the de it was a law firm and the, uh, well, the deaths of all of the lawyers had, were highly personalised um, with pictures mm. of their families and little mascots and plastic trophies that they won for deals. And I found that interesting. I also found um, the actual, I was uh, working um, a photocopier and every evening I had to, we did something called shredding where we uh, moved this large metallic dustbin around the, the offices and shredded paper. And that paper was then taken to, some other place in the depths of the building so there was the sort of organism of the office was interesting the materiality of it the materiality mm. of shredded paper and the metallic dustbins and the and the and the um the endless types of ring binding and and stationery and and stickering and and mm -hmm. that was and the whiteboards and the different doodles that i would see one day i went into an office and obviously some extremely important deal had been going on and all over the whiteboard there were numbers and arrows but there were also small mm -hmm. um stick men with smiles and stuff and so mm -hmm. there and that was a wonderful thing to see there was so there was you know I would encourage you to think again about context that you can use you know mm -hmm. in when you do so do other types of work to support yourself are there things that are unique to those experiences which could offer you a type of material palette that you might not encounter otherwise amazing when you when you spoke about the v veloplex website the, yeah. with the visual i thought if i wonder if my similar is going to a stationery shop i love i think every person loves a new pencil and loves all the wrapping and the yeah. things are laid out it's such a nice Thing to see isn't it it's kind of a similar um process we've got a question from youtube um it's someone called uh they've not left their name but they have asked do you have any recommended reading or websites for thinking about making work with waste or found material that's a good question mm. you know on youtube there's this amazing category of youtube um uh films about burning down um milk bottles and um, different kinds of plastics. There's a whole community of people um, that do this. Um, but there's also, I, I don't know the name of it, but there's a wonderful company. Um, there are loads actually in answer to this question. There's a wonderful company. Oh, I wish I, I knew them, but they they um, they tell you how to do an to to recycle plastic in an open source way. So um, there's a company called Smile Plastics in the UK that work with recycled plastics. But there's also a company I think they're in the Netherlands, and it's a collective, and they have they have created an open source um, uh, film that that where they you, you can put together a really quite simple set of kind of ovens and I'm not, they're not ovens, but sort of sieves and funnels mm -hmm. and you can basically melt uh, plastics. I will try to find, if that person left their name, I could try and find that and send it we, to we, them. We, we can add those links into the post event um, page. So they can- But there are lots of things on the internet, small scale um, 
yeah. projects and, pe and people who are trying to work with waste at home and also the waste companies which I visited, they often have things on YouTube which are quite nice. Some of the films that they've made of their facilities are really quite good as well. So things like Veolia mm. and Edwards and yeah. Cool. I guess that's again about the sort of research, like one yeah. thing will take you to the next and that's what where the curiosity comes from. Yeah. Talking about. Um, Eloise, another question. What is your advice for graduating design students about connecting with the real world collaborators? So that's sort of covering, you do lots of collaboration and lots of relationships as well within your work. Oh, but I have given just a huge talk on exactly that advice. So yeah. um, I would just say, again, don't be discouraged and also just keep, like I said, you know, people are so positive when you are interested in what they do. You know, I think that there's something in, um, you know, if you also, many times in the real world you know mm. um if you work in an industry where you know you're working on something perhaps the only audience for it sometimes is your colleagues so it can be incredibly positive if um somebody from a different discipline like design or art wants to know about what you do and likewise mm. i would i would be really happy if somebody from outside art or, you know, in the experiences at someone, in the times when someone who isn't an artist has got in touch, you know, and I think just don't be discouraged um, to mm. keep approaching, um, yeah, people. And, and those words, curiosity, exchange and engagement, I guess, that's kind of, yeah. that could be quite a word. words. Yeah. Um, going back a little bit, as a young woman or as a, as, as a kid, um, did you did you break your toys and remake them or did you did you play in that kind of tacit way yeah yeah I was absolutely I had a very very um ex you know um I had toys that I chopped up that I was obsessed <laughs> with that I um I had um I had a I had a very very involved life with toys and with things as a child in fact that was one of the first mm -hmm things that I why I went to sculpture because I used to do those uh, FEMO um, things that you could put on the tray and put in the oven and mm. I used to um, make um, toilet paper wet and build it into things and all sorts of yeah. things yeah nice. imagine, but imagine there's lots of children who don't go into art you know which yeah. And, Important. you know, pe perhaps if you don't do that, that also doesn't mean, I mean, I did, but I don't know that that means that, you know. There's no right or wrong. Yeah. With, um, with, do you follow your inner voice and your gut instincts a lot with the decisions you make? Yes. Yeah. Is that sort of a motivator to you? Like you, you get a feeling and you go for it, you throw yourself into a situation? Yes. I mean, I Very think good. that art is the area where I can trust my instincts, almost the only one. <laughs> mm. I mean, I, thank God, yes. <laughs> of course, there are issues there, but yes. Cool. I mean, that's that's good to know. I think it's really important to create people go for it, in a sense. Probably yeah, I mean, it's um, really, it's re it, it really is, um, you know, it's such a complicated choice for a life to be an artist and you know mm. I think you really must push push um along and try to banish self-doubt where you can because you, there are many other issues you'll have along the way so if you mm -hmm. can try to trust your your instincts yeah mm. and then thinking about a curator so someone that works with you on a show it's yeah. very much a, a level of trust as well you have to sort of is that a sort of give or take with a curator that you might work with? Is that a question from the um, public? Oh, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, question, yeah. <laughs> definitely, um, definitely. I think, um, you know, I think um, like a really, um, you know, I really think that you can't overstate the, the um, 
the how important that can be and how how key that can be you know a curator um i guess there are two modes of curators one might be more of a sort of hand holder you know um and the hand holding type is 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 great if you're you know it's very overwhelming making a show especially your first show um mm. and you really have no idea how to do it and and that's you know you're it's absolutely invaluable completely necessary to have someone like that but then also um you know curators are able to step outside of your work sometimes they can sort of finish the sentence for you or they can see mm. parts of your work which you don't see or they can help you to link you know what you're doing to other greater mm. concerns and i i think it's a really i mean you're I'm blessed if I get to work with a curator, to be honest, because um, mm. because that's you know the the most the nicest type of well a very nice type of exchange. You it's know, a good exchange. I, I think um, to develop that maybe as well, if people are graduating from college or art school just now, and they might they might have done art, but they want to become a curator, or they want to go into kind of operations or technical. Um, is it is it a good idea to build a collective of people like the idea of collaboration or building a collective of ideas? I know you don't really work in a collective, but yeah, I mean, you know, um, that's another approach, isn't it, for people? Definitely, definitely. Like, um, I, you know, as as as, mu as much, um, you know, I mean, it, it's a very, it's a particular route. So if you do have people that you can trust and who understand you and who, you know, um, and I, I mean, in, in a funny way, you know, I do think that being an artist is sort of one role among, among many that come together mm. to, to create what we know as the art world and to, and I think it's really important that, you know, that, that that is a, a proper exchange, you know, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, things can happen if things happen in a team always and think you know things think you know a good curator can have a better eye sometimes for your work mm -hmm. than you can obviously because you're in the middle of it and likewise you know a technical team a good technical collaborator can be there are huge dependencies yeah. there so I would yeah I would encourage you know you to those are yeah that that's definitely a Something. Mm, anyway, it's like a role, isn't it? Um, thinking about so a question from Duncan on YouTube: Have you had? Have you managed balancing your practice with paid work as your career has developed? Uh, this is in two parts. So that's the first part. The second is: What proportion of your practice would you say is publicly funded and supported versus commercial sales? And you can share as much or as little as you want to on that. Um, well, I was a recipient of an Arts Council grant. National Lottery Project Grant, which I applied for last year. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a commercial gallery who have uh, Esperanza Rosales from Oslo. And she's been, she's done, you know, really been enormously helpful. Um, so, uh, and I have also shown at Somerset House, which, you know, um, produced my exhibition and it was funded through a, number of different pots if you like um, and I was supported by Somerset House to make that exhibition through the time that it took which mm -hmm. yeah and um, and likewise uh, the I did a show at the ICA um, I would say it's a mixture of commercial sales of commercial support and public funding but probably more public funding I would say um, mm -hmm on balance because of mm -hmm. the institutions that I've worked with. So if I haven't directly been the recipient of a grant, they have. Um, so the ICA, uh, the Tate, uh, um, Somerset House, um, mm -hmm. and most recently Istanbul Biennale and Focal Point. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. Yes, I have done paid work as well, all the way through. Yeah, thanks, Eloise. That was brilliant. Um, just we've got a few minutes left. When it comes to um, juggling, you said about balance, but sort of juggling the business side of things with the creative side. Mm -hmm. How do you find that? Did you did you have some business skills when you came into being a full time artist, or have you learned yeah. as you've gone along? 
yeah. No. Like doing invoicing and all that, those kind of things. Um, really hard. I mean, you know, I mean, there are different ways that you can talk about business skills, whatever that is. And for sure, the um, the kind of writing of invoices and keeping budgets and stuff is, is very challenging and it's very challenging for everybody. And I think particularly it's, in, it's so important, you know, if there's one thing that being a professional artist that you need is just a watertight organization um, and an understanding of Excel and an understanding of um, what it takes to deliver physical artworks and and um, and it's really challenging and I didn't have the skills and they're not good enough but they're hopefully getting better in terms of that um, you know um, yeah I think yeah I think one thing is you know that I I'm very kind of keen on as I said exchange and communication and you know I hate to talk about that as a business skill you could only yeah. You know, but um, yeah, you know. Yeah, you learn as you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, is press and sort of PR important to you to get kind of your work out there, or is it more natural that people come to you with sort of ideas or offers or how to like sort of develop I mean, your practice? The things that we're talking about with press and those are of huge importance, of course. Mm -hmm. And but they're they're important because you want to continue working as an artist because you love mm. the things that you do and you know they are you know those are ways that you reach your audience and hopefully mm. that can also lead to like different types of feedback and different interesting outcomes and stuff. So so yes, in short, of course. Um, mm. you know, but I don't people often make the distinction between, you know, I don't know, it's not a question of sort of importance or not important or mm -hmm. I mean that's a sort of medium through of communication isn't it and and for me mm -hmm. practice is about communication so yeah that's one medium of it you know there are others but yeah and I guess with social media people that are graduating that may not have a lot of money just now they can sort of do some self-promotion and kind of oh I, I've never are, like are had a, a press or uh, like a PR or anything. I mean, I, I, I don't mm. have a, a, like a, I don't know artists do have that. Um, and I don't even have very active presence on social media. Um, I don't have uh, a, a Twitter or a, or a, um, or a website even. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but of course, you know, those are important, but I think, you know, so when I refer to them, I refer to the press that has been done on my behalf, working with Somerset Household, which has been wonderful, mm. you know. Um, yeah. yeah. One last question. Um, how, let me just find, there's a couple more that have came in. Uh, quickly, in an ideal world, what is the best outcome with making work? To be able to Quite continue to make work. It's mm. no small thing. Um, I mean, it sounds, you know, and to be able to, uh, and for that process of making work, as I said, to be as fully sort of integrated and collaborative and meaningful as you can manage, you know, and I, I'm also very interested in material, the material world. And so an ideal outcome would involve being in that material world. Obviously that's not easy to do at the moment with coronavirus, um, of course, but, yeah. you know, and I, I, I think I would like, you know, I, I love initiatives like um, Artist Placement Group or Marielle, oh, what's her name, who work with industries or, or I'm really interested in artists working, you know, in, there's a long, sort of case history of that or a genealogy of artists working in the world, which I love and I'm really interested in. That's a really nice way to, uh, to finish off on, Eloise. Thank you so much. That was Thank brilliant. you. <laughs> Did <laughs> you have been, a nice time? <laughs> I hope that's been helpful and it's uh, great to take part in. Yeah, we're very grateful and very lucky to have had you join us for today. So thank you so much. Um, just to remind everyone, we're back in two weeks with Coders of Colour 
Um, so until then, we'll see you again. Okay, guys. Thank you so much, Eloise. Thank you, Scott. Bye, guys. See you soon. Bye.